हेलो फ्रेंड्स वेरी गुड इवनिंग वेलकम टू द हिंदू एनालिसिस इन इंग्लिश बाय एलटीएक्स क्लासेस फर्स्ट आर्टिकल ऑफ द डे इज फ्रॉम योर जनरल स्टडीज पेपर थ्री साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी फ्रॉम पेज नंबर वन डेली एडिशन सैटेलाइट्स लॉन्च्ड बाय एसएसएलवी इन रॉन्ग ऑर्बिट दे आर नॉट यूजबल एस एस इज योर latest the newest addition to isro's armory small scale launch vehicle isro till now has two kinds of launch vehicles gslv and pslv today we have these launch vehicles now isro has added another one sslv which is small scale launch vehicle gslv and S- we will talk about them but before that i would like to talk about the concept of orbit concept of satellites then we will get into the news i would like to give you background for everything before we move into the news item so just go through this so in this image you have earth you can see earth here and this moon obviously is moving around earth in an elliptical manner so the path taken by moon the path taken by moon to move around earth is called orbit it is not just about moon it is for any any object the path taken by any object in space to move around another object is called orbit in this particular case the path taken by moon to move around earth so this is the path and this path is called orbit and it is a fixed path a fixed path taken by one object to move around another object in the space okay and and anything that you send for example you are sending a satellite what is a satellite a satellite is another thing like moon moon is also a satellite moon is a natural satellite naturally it revolves around sun suppose we send something and it also moves around earth even that is satellite so a satellite is something that moves around earth in a fixed path called orbit and moon is the best example moon is a natural satellite that moves around earth in a fixed path now you got it right and your two keywords perisi and apogee what is the meaning of perisi and apogee what is the meaning of perisi and apogee the nearest in this path if you observe in this particular path the nearest point to earth see this is the nearest point right when moon is here it is the it is nearest to earth so this point is called perisi the farthest point in that path if it is very far from earth that point is called apogee the nearest point to the earth surface is perisi the farthest point is apogee i hope you have understood these basic concepts so now what is this launch vehicle now you understood what is a satellite a satellite is something that revolves around earth in a fixed path called orbit but what is this lv launch vehicle how can the satellite go to space if a satellite has to revolve around earth it has to go to space so for that it needs to be launched that vehicle a vehicle that is used to launch these satellites into earth's orbit is called your launch vehicle we call them rockets that is what is rocket that is what is launch vehicle and we have three kinds of launch vehicles today earlier we had only two kinds gslv and pslv today we have the third kind which is sslv so what is gslv what is pslv so i will di- uh, what do you call differentiate them with respect to their applications there are a lot of technicalities we will not get into the technicalities let's differentiate them with respect to applications gslv carries uh, heavier loads heavy masses and heavier loads as example communication satellites communication satellites are quite heavy so gslvs are uh, higher powered they can carry higher masses they can take these masses these satellites to far away places even up to 36000 kilometers from earth surface up to so it can take it to a very very far away place so communication satellites are an example of satellites which are carried by gslv then you have pslv so which carry lesser loads compared to gslv they carry lesser loads and up to certain kilometers it will not go up to 
थर्टी सिक्स थाउजेंड किलोमीटर्स जनरली अप टू फोर्टीन हंड्रेड थर्टीन हंड्रेड थाउजेंड किलोमीटर्स नाइन हंड्रेड किलोमीटर्स राइट नॉट वेरी फार फ्रॉम अर्थ सो दे जनरली कैरी समथिंग कॉल्ड एथ ऑब्जर्वेशन सैटेलाइट्स दीज एथ ऑब्जर्वेशन सैटेलाइट्स आर यूज टू प्रिडिक्ट वेदर दे विल हेल्प अस इन मैपिंग दे विल हेल्प अस इन आइडेंटिफाइंग डिफरेंट रिसोर्सेस ऑन द अर्थ ई टी सी अर्थ ऑब्जर्वेशन यू कैन सी द नेम अर्थ ऑब्जर्वेशन एंड दीज आर जनरली कम्युनिकेशन सैटेलाइट कम्युनिकेशन सैटेलाइट्स आर कैरिड बाई जी एस एल वी एंड स्मॉलर वन लाइक अर्थ ऑब्जर्वेशन सैटेलाइट्स आर कैरिड बाई पी एस एल वी टूडे वी हैव थर्ड वर्षन कॉल्ड एस एस एल वी विच इज स्मॉल सैटेलाइट लॉन्च वेहिकल सो इट कैरीज ईवन स्मॉलर वन ईवन स्मॉलर मीनिएचर सैटेलाइट्स मैक्रो सैटेलाइट्स नैनो सैटेलाइट वेरी स्मॉल वन कंपेर्ड टू द वन कैरिड बाई पी एस एल वी एंड जी एस एल वी एस एस एल वी कैरी ईवन स्मॉलर सैटेलाइट्स right that is why these sslvs are built so why why do we need sslvs when you already have gslv and pslv for example you have a very small satellite and you want to send it to earth send it to space but pslv carries it has a capacity of bigger ones you know all these satellite launches are expensive they are not cheap and you have a very small one it is like imagining a bus a bus has 60 seats and you you are only five people so do you want to you do you want the bus driver to immediately start for him it's a loss right only five people are there the bus can carry 60 people it it is like that pslv you can carry much higher masses but we we you only have a small satellite so unless you have those many satellites that it can carry it will not move so you will have to wait You you are a university or you are a small organization. You want to send a small observation satellite to space, but since it today we only have PSLV and GSLV. GSLV is anyway ruled out. It's a very big one. You cannot afford the cost. And even if you go, if you want to go with PSLV, you will have to wait because it can carry a much higher masses. So you will have to wait for uh, many such similar satellites to come. It, I I gave you the example of bus unless. 50 or 60 people come the bus driver will not start similarly the pslv will not launch the isro will not launch pslv unless it has all the satellites which can fill the stomach of a pslv right that is the reason they are coming out with this new uh, small scale launch vehicle small satellite launch vehicle which is much cheaper which which is much cheaper to assemble which can carry smaller loads and which which has a very small turn around time very small turn around time so i'll tell you how useful it is for example for a pslv it takes 72 day, 72 hours to integrate sorry for pslv it takes 70 days to integrate to put together the satellite but for sslv it takes only 3 days so within 3 days you can integrate PSLV requires 50 to 60 scientists SSLV requires 5 to 6 scientists so very quick turn around time so very quickly you can integrate this and you can get it ready that is why we call it on demand whenever you want you can get it ready and whenever you have a small satellite and you can use SSLV and at 1 tenth of the cost at 1 tenth of the cost for a pslv you can send the satellite to space disadvantage obviously it can carry only smaller loads it cannot carry bigger loads but it's okay today most of the satellites that we are sending to space are small in size most of that most of them are small in size most of them are small in size when you when you only have four people it is better to go for a when you when you are only four people you can take an auto right similar like similar to bus versus auto when you are only 3 it is better you take auto you don't need bus right so it saves time <coughs> you can go quickly so that is the objective or logic of sslv now isro launched a few satellites using sslv unfortunately those satellites were put in wrong orbit and they are not usable are you getting it are you getting it they are no longer usable because this sslv put them in elliptical orbit instead of circular it was supposed to put them in circular orbit but it put them in elliptical orbit what is the difference this is circular right you know this shape 
this is elliptical it was supposed to put it in circular orbit but it put it in elliptical orbit that is where the whole problem is that is where the whole problem is so this particular sslv carried two satellites one one earth observation satellite the other one is a student assembled azadi sat it is the co passenger the main one is earth observation satellite and then there is a smaller satellite called azadi sat assembled by students of india so this azadi sat is a 8u cube sat so cube sat what is a cube sat 10 10 10 so this is called 1u u means unit 10 cm into 10 cm into 10 cm this is the dimension cube dimension right this is called 1u when you have 8u 80 into 80 into 80 so 80 cm into 80 cm into 80 cm so that is your cube sat or small sat small satellites are cube satellites miniature satellites you call them miniature satellite you call them cube satellite you call it with many names right so and this particular cube sat was carrying 75 different payloads each weighing around 50 grams girl students from rural regions across the country were provided guidance to build these payloads so across the across the country girl students from different rural regions they created these 50 gram small small ones and 75 into such 50 gram payloads is what this small satellite is carrying its weight is just 8 kg its weight is just 8 kg so that is about this and one more thing this sslv places satellites into 500 km low earth orbit low earth is less than 1000 km from the surface from the surface if the distance between the surface and the path taken the orbit is less than 1000 km you call it low earth orbit so sslv and pslv generally both of them are used in low earth orbit but less than 500 we are now we are going to use sslv is predominantly i hope you have got it so this is the stuff that you need to understand in this article so let's move on to the next one so the second article of the day is an editorial from page number 6 focused on inflation so i will give you the brief about this we don't need to read the entire editorial here so i'll give you the concept the rbi reserve bank of india reserve bank of india has increased repo rate by 50 basis points now the repo rate in india is 5.4% 5.4% now why are they increasing repo rate to control to control inflation inflation is not under control today when inflation is very high it retards consumption it retards consumption think about it whenever prices of commodities are very high what will happen we will postpone our purchases if they are going up quick quickly we will postpone our purchases that way your consumption will go down whenever you your consumption goes down sales of goods and services will go down whenever sales of goods and services go down it leads to whenever sales go down it leads to it affects growth it affects growth of the economy it affects growth of the economy so what should we do we need to control inflation so what is rb trying to do it has increased interest rate it has increased interest rate so what happens when rbi increases interest rate so what happens when reserve bank of india increases interest rate very important aspect i want you to pay full attention here whenever rbi increases interest rate your loans become expensive deposits become attractive so a person who is having money he would like to keep his money in bank deposit because deposits are becoming attractive 
a person who doesn't have money a person who doesn't have money who would want to take loan to get money now he will also postpone why because loan interest rate has gone up loans are becoming expensive so he will either not take it or postpone it unless it is absolutely necessary he will postpone taking loans so what is happening in these two cases the money is going away from people person having money is keeping it in banks person who doesn't have money is not taking loans so people will not have cash in hand when they don't have cash they will stay away from when they don't have cash they will stay away from unnecessary purchases whenever they have money they will purchase unnecessarily now they will stay away from unnecessary purchases when they stay away from unnecessary purchases it reduces demand it reduces demand and prices will prices will cool cool down whenever demand goes down prices will cool down when all this unnecessary money is chasing goods and services it artificially increases demand for goods and price also goes up so the, we are we are trying to cut down these unnecessary purchases for that the government of india no rbi is increasing interest rate so this is why this is how the reserve bank of india tries to control inflation and help the economy too much of inflation is not going to help the economy remember this right and i will also talk about a key word called accommodative monetary policy accommodative what is the meaning of accommodative policy a policy which accommodates the aspirations of industry industry wants want industry always wants low interest rate because whenever they want to take loan they want to pay less interest industry wants low interest rate so any policy which supports low interest rates which maintains low interest rates which reduces <coughs> interest rates as per the aspirations of industry is an accommodative policy is an accommodative policy now rbi wants to discontinue this accommodative policy till now rbi had this accommodative policy now rbi wants to discontinue this accommodative policy why to control inflation to control inflation now it wants to discontinue accommodative policy which means it will move away from low interest rate to high interest rates i hope you are getting the concept so this is what the whole concept of uh, inflation and the link between inflation and monetary policy here and so this article again comes under general studies paper 3 Indian economy, economic development. So let's move on to third article, another editorial, another opinion column from page number six. So this is the third article of the day from General Studies Paper Two, important from GS Two perspective. India, democracy and the promised republic. So within few days we are going to celebrate our seventy fifth Independence Day, and where are we? compared to what was envisaged as what was imagined in 1947 so what was the promised republic what was the promised democracy and where are we standing now so let's try to understand from this article by balakrishnan he was comparing what nehru imagined india would be or india should be and what we are doing today what we are doing today and what have we achieved in these 75 years so he starts by saying he starts by saying so we are going to celebrate 75 years as a political independent political entity because out of all these south asian empire which got freedom from britain india alone has maintained some stability most of the countries were unstable their constitutions needed to be written again they struggled but india was managed to stay stable even with so much diversity even with so much diversity in our cultures in our languages in our ethnicities in our uh, habits and all of them 
but still we were able to remain stable not many not no civil war was there no need of writing constitution again no such things but do we measure a country's progress only by stability yes he says stability would be a low standard we should not measure how far we have come just based on stability we have to look at certain other things we have to look at certain other things so the other talks about the status of democracy in india so what is democracy is democracy only about protocols of governance is it only about procedures or is it about outcomes but how do we define democracy the other says we define democracy as being government by discussion which means government should consult people should consult all stakeholders while making decisions so we talk about participatory we talk about representative we talk about representative we we have to ensure that everybody participates in decision making we have to ensure representation of all people only then we have true democracy but unfortunately what is the actual meaning of democracy rule by people what is the meaning of rule by people ultimately empowering individual the central aim of uh, democracy is empowerment what is empowerment empowerment is to make the individual to lead the kind of life that he or she values whatever life she values whatever life they value they should have the ability the government must empower them to reach their goals it must provide them with opportunities to reach their goals is it happening today is it happening today so that is the reason the author says india must be judged by the extent to which it has advanced human development all indians are they empowered are they developed enough to go after their goals whatever life they value whatever life they want are they able to achieve it are they able to achieve it that is the central question so we have to judge india's progress by the human development that we have managed to get managed to achieve so let's look at the human development that india has managed to get in 75 years and then let's judge our success that's what the author is saying so he was referring to nehru's message on 15th august 1947 the speech is famously known as trist with destiny in that speech nehru spoke about the true meaning of freedom he says to bring freedom and opportunity what is the objective of freedom what is the objective of independence to bring freedom to bring opportunity to common man to peasants to workers of india to fight and end poverty ignorance and disease to build up a prosperous democratic progressive nation we have to build such kind of a nation and to create social economic and political institutions that will ensure justice and fullness of life to every man and woman only when we are able to do all this that's the true meaning of freedom so this is the object where should we go yes we have got freedom now where should we go and what should be our endeavor he says this should be our endeavor and this is where we have to go this is what we have to achieve this is what we have to achieve he talks about india where equal opportunity prevails where equal opportunity prevails now let's see whether we have achieved it the goal or we are far away from the particular goal so today if you look at india gender based inequality is rampant women and men are not equal in india within every social group women are worse off than their men you take oc bc sc st you take whatever category you want to take but women are not doing better than men men are doing better than women they are less nourished when i'm saying better than men better than not better than men they are not getting equal opportunities that is what i meant to say they are less nourished less educated right 
and have a representation in institutions of governance far lower than their share of population they are 50% of the population but their their representation in institutions is far less while they participate equally in elections yes in terms of election participation women and men vote equally but at high table of governance which means at higher positions they are denied a place they are not there not many women are there at higher places and one more thing something that is not evident in official statistics what is it the extent of women's autonomy with respect to their lives with respect to their own lives does a woman have a decision making power does she have autonomy for example i am a woman i want to work am i allowed to work or should i take permission from my husband you will have to take permission from your husband you will have to take permission from your father in law right still we are living in a patriarchal society wherein men are making decisions women are simply following so certain things are visible in official statistics you can say so these many women are there in government employment compared to their population of 50% only some x number of women are there in government offices that is something you can see but there are certain things you cannot see things which happen at home they do not have autonomy they are unable to make decisions on their own and this is reflected in the very low female labor labor force participation what is the meaning of labor force participation what is labor force first of all what is labor force a labor force includes all those who have got job and all those who want to work people who are working and people who want to work and both categories put together is called labor force if a woman wants to work and actively seeks work and she will also be considered as part of labor force unfortunately in labor force participation women participation is very less why why because of their secondary position in the society in sec in the society they do not have primary position men are dominant women are simply following what men are saying due to economic deprivation and it leads to economic deprivation and the social restriction that discourages them from working outside the home why is it because of the social restriction families don't allow women to work outside their home because of which in india women participation in labor force is quite less so other starts off by saying gender inequality we are talking about equality do we have equality in india no first thing he talks about gender inequality oh, men and women are not same in india he talks about different reasons the second thing that he talks about is regional differentiation first of all he compared the other compared india with china with respect to health and education china is doing far better than india this is one aspect even within india there is regional differentiation even within india there is regional differentiation south and western part of india are doing better than rest of the country southern part and western part are doing better than rest of the country if you look at recent niti ayog data released by niti ayog it shows multi dimensional poverty in bihar to be over 50% poverty in bihar is over 50% whereas it in kerala it is just over 1% kerala belongs to india bihar belongs to india and there is so much difference between kerala and india sorry kerala and bihar there is so much difference between kerala and bihar with respect to poverty so there is so much regional differentiation even within india is that is what other is trying to say other is trying to say why the other is asking the question why why there is so much difference between kerala and bihar he talks about he talks about one aspect called democracy is embedded in society leaving some of its functioning to be determined by the social structure the functioning of democracy is linked to social structure he says south and west of india show greater development because they have witnessed greater social transformation what is social transformation according to him for example weakening of the traditional hierarchy allowing for greater say in governance of once excluded groups these lower castes poor people all these people they did not have any say in terms of governance earlier but southern states and western states they have provided more opportunities to 
once excluded groups so generally these groups are poor when you allow them when you give them reservations when you give them more opportunities when you allow them to take part in governance poverty will definitely reduce that is what the author is trying to say right and and which adopt which leads to adoption of a public policy that furthers the well being of the latter so you, when these people for example from scs sts obcs if they become ministers they become part of the government what happens they will come out with public policy which furthers the well being of their communities he is saying in south and west it happened so because of which they came out with good policies which help the well being of these communities and because of which poverty is less in these states compared to state like bihar state like bihar so the other says in kerala and tamil nadu we have very good development indicators human development indicators with respect to health or with respect to education and it is because of the social transformation because the society gave more importance to lower groups lower economic and lower caste groups they also participated in governance in these two states because of which we have better development indicators a society which gives equal opportunity which considers all sections of society progresses that's what the author tries to indicate here however even with this kind of progress we still have patriarchy and caste even in these states it is uh, it remain writ large which means it remains visible clear in even in these two states which are supposedly better than states like bihar so we still have a lot of distance to be traveled to attain equality of opportunity equality of opportunity and finally the author also talks about subversion of democracy what is the status of democracy today in india right even nehru was prescient prescient means imagining or knowing what is going to happen in future even nehru couldn't predict what was to come after his death first there was emergency under the regime of uh, indira gandhi nehru never ever imagined that emergency would be imposed in india on account of internal reasons on account of external reasons it's okay if there is war you don't have an option but for for internal reasons internal disturbance showing internal disturbance as a reason indira gandhi imposed emergency and today today under current government we still have constitution but civil liberties have a precarious existence people civil liberties are in danger we do not have liberties freedom of expression freedom of uh, expression of individuals is curtailed means cut down press has been intimidated press has been intimidated religious minorities especially muslims are feeling insecure today they are not feeling secure and there is a perceived weaponization of the law by state what is the meaning of weaponization of law state is using law as a weapon to harass people they don't like if someone state doesn't like state can use law as a weapon for example your uapa your pmla all these acts it can use as weapons against people whom they don't like that's what the other finally concludes in this so finally he again talks about nehru's statement towards the end of his life what did nehru say look at this india could not achieve sufficient progress in agriculture why because we seem to imagine that crops would somehow grow on their own so we did not do enough research we did not do enough development we could not do much then how will we improve in agriculture we could not improve and if you link the same statement to today's society after 75 years we may have to come to recognize a similar truth about our democracy democracy doesn't develop on its own just like uh, you cannot leave everything to political representatives democracy needs nurturing just like a plant even democracy needs nurturing and we need to realize that the price of freedom is eternal vigilance you got freedom but you have to be vigilant you have to be vigilant means watchful 
you cannot leave everything to political representatives and keep quiet you have to be watchful you have to see what they are doing you have to raise your voice if they are not following democratic principles you have to teach them a lesson if they are being undemocratic if they are being corrupt if they are curtailing fundamental rights you have to teach them a lesson only then democracy survives in a country like india which means people have to take an active part people have to take an active role in preserving democracy we cannot leave it just to the whims and fancies of these politicians that's what the other is finally trying to control having said that he is also appreciating the heroic efforts of right to information activists right at the same time he is he is criticizing the middle classes who didn't care they got benefited from economic policies but they have contributed relatively little to safeguard democracy they are not active they always keep quiet they don't get into political process at all they don't get into political process at all on one hand we might feel the era of civil liberties is over in india but he says it would be premature our civil liberties over just because today we have a draconian a powerful government with a lot of majority they can they are taking decisions without consulting they are bringing in laws which are curtailing people's civil liberties they are cutting down or curtailing civil restricting liberties so the era of civil liberties is it over no because we have elections we have elections in 1977 when indira gandhi imposed emergency when indira gandhi cut down civil liberties of people we taught people taught her a lesson by defeating her again in 1989 and 2014 people conveyed spirit that we don't like corruption in 1989 and 2014 in both these years congress party was defeated because of corruption in 1989 before that uh, there was beaufort scam in 2014 before 2014 we have this 2g scam and other scams coal scam 2g scam several scams so people did not like corruption people did not want to tolerate corruption then they used elections as weapons and they taught the governments a lesson in 1977 it was against the curtailment of civil liberties in 89 and 2014 it was against corruption so on one hand he is saying people are not doing enough on the other hand he is saying people you cannot say that they they are not completely doing anything yes there are certain instances they have showed political spirit by defeating these parties so that is all about this particular article so it evaluates india's current standing it evaluates india's current standing with respect to its democratic principles with respect to equality of opportunity